it is time once again to do a quarterly reading check-in. And guys, I have so much ground to cover because I actually had nine books in the third quarter that I gave a 4.5 or a 5 star to. So just to kind of set the context of that, for me, a 4.5 star book is a favorite book of the year and a 5 star is an all-time favorite. In a given year, I read 250 to 300 books, and of that group, I give out probably 20-ish 4.5 or 5 stars. So nine in three months is actually really, really good. And yeah, without further ado, because we have a lot of ground to cover, I'm going to kind of just get into it. So uh, I'm going to go in no particular order, I think. Yeah, we'll just start. We'll start with the 4.5s and then we'll, we'll move into the five stars at the end. So first, let's go with a mystery. So One by One by Ruth Ware, I gave 4.5 stars to. And this is one that is an isolated close circle mystery, which if you watch this channel, you know, is one of my, well, probably my very favorite tropes. Basically, where a bunch of people get stuck somewhere, somebody dies, they got to figure out who done it before more of them die. And uh, Ruth Ware, I think, is known as more of a thriller author in general. But this definitely, I think, is strongly in the mystery thriller end of things, meaning there's a definite whodunit in this. I found that this hit that trope really effectively. Basically, it's a group of work colleagues who are in the Alps for an important conference to kind of determine the fate of their app that they have going forward. There's, you know, some acrimony and drama when they get there already. And then there's this big blizzard. And in the midst of this blizzard and avalanches, somebody is missing or dead, and they've got to figure out who done it before maybe more of them get done. So uh, I just thought that this hit that trope really effectively. I think if you're expecting something super thriller paced where it's like boom 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 maybe this isn't going to be as effective. I do also wish that this had had at least one more point of view. I think that would have made it like even better but I think that this is a super fun like this just hits my pleasure buttons. It gives me what I want from this trope and uh, I think if that's kind of the spirit you go into this with you're gonna enjoy it probably. I would maybe that would be my assumption. But anyway, I really enjoyed this 4.5 stars. This has been I think a good quarter by the way for mysteries. I was having a little bit of a slump I feel like this year in mystery, but I read a few in the third quarter that I very much enjoyed. Next, let's go nonfiction maybe. So I Have Nothing Is Wrong and Here Is Why by Alexandra Petri. And wow guys, this book is funny and so dark. This is one of the darkest things I've read this year. Actually, a few of the things on this list are pretty grim. So maybe we'll we'll kind of go back and forth. I don't want to get too dark on you guys for the whole time. But basically, this is a collection of Alexander Petri's satirical writings for the Washington Post. She has like a, a not weekly, but a regular column there, where she basically just writes sort of satirical, political and cultural pieces. And this has basically started with the advent of the Trump administration. And there's a lot of stuff in here calling out that administration and all of the bananas things that go on with it. There's a great piece, which I remember when it was published originally, of the day that Trump actually became a stable genius and like him dawning, like his dawning realization of like everything that's going on around him. That's very funny. There's a take on Get Out with Melania Trump and Michelle Obama. That's very funny. Or maybe it's Ivanka Trump. It's one of the one of them. That's very funny. There there is commentary about like international relation things, um, things that have been going on at the border. Like it's heavy subject matter, but it is so, it has such a fresh, funny, satirical take to it that you're laughing, but it's very much gallows humor. So I just, there's new pieces in this as well as some of her um, kind of tried and true favorites all around. I just thought this was really, really great. I don't know, be in the right headspace when you read this though, because it just does make you remember all of the things that have happened in the last four years and it may kind of boggle your mind a little bit. Back to something a little lighter. Let's go with Spoiler Alert by Olivia Dade. This is a super fun contemporary romance that is completely based in like geeky fandom stuff. So basically the setup is is that the dude is one of the main characters on a Game of Thrones-esque sort of like high quality HB, like premium cable television show that is absolutely beloved. And there's a ton of fan fiction about it. And the heroine is one of the like preeminent fan fictioneers within that universe. And nobody knows that he 
basically is really frustrated with the way that the show is portraying his character. So he, like, as an outlet, also writes fan fiction, and they are friends. They're internet friends, but neither of them, like, knows who they are in real life kind of thing. And through, you know, circumstances, they end up meeting in real life. He knows that she is his internet buddy, she doesn't know it's him. And then like, there's a romance and, and you know, things ensue. I just thought that this was so, it has all these interstitials with a lot of like, postings on the fan boards and like different excerpts of people's fan fiction. I thought it did a really good job of painting this, giving you a solid sense of what the fictional world the show is like, that they're all a part of the fandom on. I. <sighs> There's just so much to like in this. It's really, it's genuinely funny in a lot of places. It has an extremely progressive sense of sort of like gender politics and just generally like a very modern sensibility to it, which I appreciated. Uh, the heroine is plus size and I think that piece is handled pretty well for the most part in this book. And all around, I just think that this is a really, if you really enjoyed like Well Met by Jen DeLuca last year and part of what you loved about it was sort of just adults unabashedly being geeky about things, I think this has a lot of that same energy to it and this just made me smile a lot throughout so it's also pretty spicy in some places so this one I also gave four and a half stars to we'll go something also dark back to dark four and a half stars to the great influenza by John M Barry this is a historical nonfiction book about the Spanish flu outbreak in in the middle of World War one so like the late teens and I think part of what makes this stand out to me, at least, is that I'm somebody who really loves the history of science. And I really enjoyed about the first third of this was kind of going through the development of medicine and like medical practice in America. And I thought that was super interesting. And he, he does that sort of to kind of set the stage of what the state of American medicine was by the time the flu hit and like how equipped or ill-equipped we were to deal with it. So I thought that was really interesting. And then obviously this year, this is a very relevant book. It's been recommended a lot. I mean, like for obvious reasons, I think it is worthwhile to get some historical perspective on, I think, I don't, I can't remember if the Spanish flu is like the deadliest plague outbreak we've ever had in recorded human history, but it's like definitely up there. It's like one of the deadliest. And just like getting perspective on how like 100 years later what we have and have not learned from it, I think was very interesting. So, you know, again, maybe like a modicum of caution here of like, depending on what your mind space is, that may not be something you want to kind of get into. But I actually found it really um, helpful to give myself like historical perspective on the events of 2020. So recommend this one, four and a half stars there. Go back to mystery. Okay, so why don't we go with The Eighth Detective? Now, I will tell you that I think, so I gave four and a half stars to The Eighth Detective by Alex Pavasi, and I think if I had to tell you my favorite mystery I've read this year, it may be this. I think that that's a minority opinion, and I can't tell if it's because people, I think some of it is that people don't always have the right expectations of what this book is when they go into it, and therefore when they get to the ending, I think people, if they don't have an expectation that there's like this meta element to it, they are disappointed. So I do want to just throw that out there that I think I somewhat have a minor minority opinion. Some of that I think is some of the expectation setting and some of it is I think that this is a very strong flavor and you may or may not like that flavor. So to tell you, give you a sense of what this book is, this book is a collection of seven interconnected short stories that have a framing device, meaning that there is the seven individual short stories and then in between each story, you have an overarching other story that's bringing them all together. So the framing device is that this woman has gone to Crete to talk to this reclusive author who wrote these seven mystery short stories in like the 1930s and 40s. It's the 1970s and they are wanting to republish them. So in between each of the short stories, you are getting that story happening. And the meta quality of this is that the short stories were written in a way to try to address every possible combination of solutions in a mystery based on the author's like theory of how mystery works. So it's very meta in its discussion about like how a, a whodunit works and especially the sort of golden age type of whodunit. So there's a lot of discussion of that and there's a lot about playing with expectations. And this book calls it shots in a lot of places and then either 
does what it said it was going to do or does it but then subverts it. Like, there's a lot of playing with reader expectations in this book. That is something that I love in a book. And I found I really like some of the individual short stories. This has one of my very favorite isolated close circle mysteries I've ever read. I love that short story. And I just like that this is bold. Like this is different than a lot of books I've read. And as somebody who loves mystery, I really enjoyed seeing an author like playing with its conventions. I just had a really good time in this book. And again, I don't think it's one for everyone. And I just I know that some people get let down by like how this ultimately ends. But I thought all of that was just really fun, playful, different. And yeah, it just really worked for me. So for me, this was a big thumbs up, a little bit controversial. What can I say? Then to go dark again, maybe we'll talk about The Burning God by R.F. Kuang. And this is one that I don't really feel like I can talk a lot about because it is the third book in a trilogy. So it is the final book in an epic fantasy series that I can't really get into specifics about because they would be spoilers. I will just give you the overall setup for this series, which is it's basically a, an epic fantasy reimagining of the Opium Wars, the main character based somewhat on the historical figure of Mao Zedong. And if you know anything about those two elements, you can surmise that this is an extremely grim, dark type fantasy series. This is a series with a very dark point of view on humans <laughs> and on the world. And that is not going to be for everyone. The first two books I, I really, really enjoyed, especially as like an overarching series. Like that's, that's kind of what I leave this series with. Like I adore the overall story journey of that series or of the trilogy, individual books, I had things I liked more and less. So in the first two books, I enjoyed them. But there was some pacing issues I had that made me give those books each four stars, even though I very much enjoyed them. This last book, I think is definitely the strongest of the three, because it I think resolves some of those pacing issues. And it just nails the landing. It made me cry so many times. It's just really poignant. Um, it's military fantasy. So there's a lot about like military strategy stuff in there. So that's also something that some people probably will like more or less. I think I'm neutral on it. This book like made it work for me. But just FYI there. But yeah, it was really, really good. So 4.5 stars for that. And for the trilogy as a whole, I would give it five stars. But like each individual book I didn't like as much as like the sum of the parts. So that was 4.5 stars. And then my last 4.5 star for this quarter is The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. And this is a dark, darkly funny, like satirical, maybe a uh, horror novel about that's like thematically about white flight, but um, uses a vampire as the monster to talk about that topic. So I just think that this book has a lot of really interesting things to say about race and gender in the American South in the 90s. And I'm probably biased because I grew up in the kind of like white suburbs in the South in the 90s. So like I recognized a lot of the women in here for sure. And a lot of the sort of tone of what it was trying to get across. And I think it did a really good job of interrogating the basis of that life and like what the kind of like underlying stuff sort of just like bubbling under the culture of that time and place were. I really appreciated that and I think it's got some very graphics not quite the right word but just like it'll it'll make you go Ugh. like it's got some like icky things that I mean it gets into like real horror moments but I just thought thematically this book was so smart and I thought it was really effective at getting across the metaphor that horror usually has like some sort of underlying strong theme or metaphor and to me that was really strong in this book and I really appreciated that I thought it was thoughtful and interesting and yeah just all it also I think is super well written. Like I couldn't put this down. I, I just like plowed through this in a day because I just was totally drawn in by it. So my last 4.5 star pick and one that again, I don't know is for everyone, but I really enjoyed and definitely look forward to reading more from Grady Hendrix. And then I have two five star books I want to talk about. So we'll talk about Ring Shout first, which I don't have my physical copy of yet, but it comes out mid October. And I originally gave this four and a half stars. But when I was talking about it in my end of the month wrap up, I just realized like, no, this is five stars. Like this is an all time favorite. This is a fantasy novella that is set in like alternative history, American South. 
and basically the metaphor it's playing with is what if the KKK were literal monsters and not just like human garbage, like literalizes them as monsters and we are following a trio of monster hunters. And it's set in like the 20s and the idea is that the birth of a nation, which was like a major innovation in film, but uh, like perpetuated really, really awful, harmful racial like violence and, and chaos. Like what if that film actually like stirred up magic and, and made these people people who were in these white hoods, you don't know which ones are actually people versus ones that have been like ta actually taken over by this magical monstrous force. And this book, I think I just am honestly astounded by the craftsmanship of it. It is a novella and it has more to say about so many different topics, themes, and ideas than most books that I read that are like three, four, five hundred pages. Like this book packs so much in, in a way that never feels dull or draggy. Like it keeps, like it's so action packed. The plot is so engaging. The characters are so like lovable and you're engaged with them. It does all of this like idea work in such a fun way way, at least from my taste of what I find enjoyable in this kind of fantasy book. I just was beyond impressed by it. I am like, just I am astounded by its craftsmanship. It's so good. So I realized I had to give it five stars because I cannot help but stand. So my first five star pick. And then the last book I'm going to talk about my last five star pick and what is my favorite book right now of the year and in another book that I'm genuinely just like astounded by as a first book in a trilogy is Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. This also I believe comes out in the middle of October. So people should be getting it right around now. This book just does everything right to me. Like there's I I honestly don't have any critiques of it, which is rare for me in a book. Uh, I'm trying to think. Maybe there's one point of view that I was probably slightly less engaged with than the others, but not even really that. Like, there are four point of views. I think they're all great. It has one of the most wild opening scenes that just like grabs you by the throat and like keeps you in from there on in in the book. My favorite character is sort of this Rakes pirate lady who is just fantastic. It is an epic fantasy that is rooted in pre-Columbian culture for its magic systems and setting. And I think that was super interesting and different than what I've read, at least. I thought I was so engaged by all of that. I love the characters. It was paced so well, like there was action throughout, but it didn't feel just like crammed in. Like I felt like it was appropriately paced and felt really satisfying and it's in its action. I just and the way it ends is super interesting. We've got I think at least two more books coming for this little series. I can't wait to read them. I just I cannot tell you how much I just had such a great time in this book. Loved it. Rebecca Roanhorse is an auto buy author for me at this point. I just love what she does. I love her writing style and kind of the types of books she writes like her projects tend to be really interesting to me. And this book just like totally hit the spot. I just love this book. I'm so impressed by it. I can't I just can't say enough about it. So that was so lovely. I just spent 20 minutes gushing about things that I loved reading this year, which is just a nice state of affairs. So yeah, those were the nine books I had to talk about for Q3. Like it was just a really, I didn't read as, September was just a weird month. Um, but July and August were like two fantastic reading months for me, both in quality and quantity. I just had a really good time. And uh, it was a really, yeah, it's just been a really good uh, few months of reading for me. So it was fun to sort of cast my mind back on some of these books that I'd encountered recently. But I just read so much, it's, it's, it can be easy for me to forget sometimes some of the things I love. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed hearing just sort of a summary of my favorite books and things that I particularly would, you know, recommend to people. Let me know what you thought of any of these books if you have read them in the comments below. And yeah, I think that that will do it for this video. So if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, along with a link to register to vote. And please make sure you have made a plan to vote, uh, early vote, cast an absentee ballot, plan to go in person, whatever you got to do, get yourself to the polls this year. If you don't vote, you don't get to complain. And I love complaining. So I will be there. And uh, yeah, I think that that wraps it up for now. So hope you are having an absolutely lovely day today. And I will just talk to you soon. Bye.